So we are in Genesis chapter 41, if you want to turn there. And uh, last week we finished chapter 40 and started chapter 41. So um, the good news is last week in chapter 41, we really didn't get all that far. Um, I'm, as a matter of fact, we, we got so, we, we, we didn't get past verse 1. So I'm going to start at verse 1 again, all right? And uh, what I'll do is, let me see, it's just verse 1. So let me start there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip through it because I did go through it last week. So I'm not going to spend as much time on it. This way we can actually get into the dreams. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. No wonder that doesn't make sense. Okay, 40, 41. Okay, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. After what two whole years? Right? So that causes you to have to go back to chapter 40. After two years of the chief cupbearer being restored and not telling Pharaoh about him as he said he would, two more years go by. Okay? And we did the math last year and we figured out, and I'm not going to get into it this week. Um, but if you, I'll give you the two scriptures, but 13 years approximately is what Joseph spent in jail total. All right. The reason we know this is, um, let me see if I can find the verse. Nope. I can't find it. So anyway, that's, oh, wait a second. I do have it. Okay. So in Genesis 37, 2, it says this. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. So we know when everything started happening between Joseph and his brothers, Joseph was 17. So we have, the, if, you, if you read what happened between Joseph and his brothers, the context reveals that a this all happened really fast. It's not like within a span of five years, Joseph's brothers hated him so much that they threw him into a cistern and then sold him to traders. He had one dream. He had another dream. He told his brothers about it. They took it as boasting, and it caused them to be hate, hate him. Um, which brother was it? I forget. Joseph's getting the coat, and having the dream was basically... Joseph was telling this brother, I am the favored son, instead of the oldest brother. I think it was Reuben? Yeah. And um, so now Reuben is really angry at Joseph and really is despising Joseph. And all of this culminates. His father sends him to go find his brothers out shepherding the flocks. He goes. This plan is hatched. It, it probably all happened within a few months. All right. So Joseph's 17 years old. So when Joseph is sold into slavery... He's 17 years old. Then in Genesis 41, 46, it says Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which has all kinds of implications. But for what we're talking about right here, it means that 730 minus 17, 13. So we know that Joseph spent maximum 13 years in prison. More probably like 12 to 12 and a half, just to give time for him to get to Egypt, get sold, go to Potiphar, have Potiphar's wife hit on him, finally do it again, and he runs, and she accuses him of rape, and he ends up in prison. All right, so we have to allow for time for that to pass, all right? Okay. So conclusion, we simply do not know actually how much time he spent in prison, but we can speculate to say 12, 12 and a half years. We also know that due to the chief cupbearer who, and I also went over with you that the definition of cupbearer is literally butler. All right. Because you can, you can picture there being a chief butler because Pharaoh would have many butlers, wouldn't he? You know, it makes us think of the king and queen of England. You know, they have a whole slew of servants and the chief butlers over all of them. Well, if you just go with chief cupbearer and you look at it and you go, this guy who's the chief person who holds the cup of Pharaoh, it's how many people do you need to do that? He's in his court. Whenever Pharaoh wants something to drink, he pours, you know what I mean? So Butler's a little more realistic as far as um, what it's saying. But he is the chief. He is the man closest to Pharaoh of all his servants, all right? Ch -ch -ch -ch. 
And we also know that due to the chief cupbearer's neglect and forgetfulness, Joseph spent two more years in prison. That's what verse 1 is telling us. Um, Then he had to. But you have to realize, we can say, yeah, this is all on the chief cupbearer. He didn't tell Pharaoh about it. But really, he spends two more years in prison because God wanted him to spend two more years in prison. All right? And we'll see, I think in tonight's chapter, that Joseph will... No, it's not in tonight's chapter, but will at some point recollect to his brothers to say that everything he went through, God put him through. He gives God all the credit <laughs> for, the, for what he went through. But he does it looking at the good that came out of it, all right? Which is really the main lesson that I brought home to you last week, and I'll be bringing home to you again tonight, is that, you know, God runs our lives with a, a, a far higher view of where you are, where you're going, and where you're going to arrive. So what we see is hardships. It doesn't negate the fact that they are hardships, and we're going to see that in tonight's study. It just means that God will use all things for our good, and that he has designed for us all believers a good end. And that everything that we went through leading up to that, the good, the bad, and the ugly, was all a part of God transforming us, conforming us, sanctifying us, uh, chiseling us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, in our character. All right? Okay. I think that pretty much catches me up to where, yes, I wanted to... Just go over that. That's the most important thing. And what I'm going to do at a later time is I'll probably do like a Bible study at home of 40, uh, what I did last week, just so I can on YouTube keep the flow going because I post all these videos on YouTube on our channel. All right. So now we're actually up to the dreams. All right. So Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing in by the Nile. Now, Pharaoh, this isn't the only dream Pharaoh ever had. Pharaoh had many dreams just like you have in your life. The cupbearer and the baker, they had many dreams in their life. None of them made them wake up going, oh my goodness, I'm really troubled. Oh, oh. And at, So much so that Joseph would see them and go, you look troubled, man. What's going on? Right? So the point simply being that the two dreams that, that the cupbearer had and the butler had were not unique in that they were dreams because we all dream they were unique in that those were prophetic dreams god gave them for joseph to interpret all right specifically pharaoh's dream is going to be a dream he gives to pharaoh that's prophetic and also disturbing that is intended for Joseph to interpret. And really, when you think about it, everything that's happened to Joseph up to this point, including the cupbearer forgetting him, is all leading up to this moment where the cupbearer goes, oh my goodness, sir, I can't believe it. What? Well, you're telling me about your dream, and there's this guy when we were in prison two years ago, and I promised him I'd tell you about him, and I forgot. I was just so happy to have my life back, you know, which I don't buy, but... And he acknowledges that's an offense, and we're going to see that right here. All right, so verse 1. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin, thin cows ate up the seven attractive cows plump cows and pharaoh awoke so that was a um a moment did you ever wake up from a dream get startled awake from a dream well it's always because something in the dream happens that startles you awake now you read that dream and it's really not a particularly nasty dream and yet pharaoh is startled awake but think about it all right now this is kind of whitewashed all right Let's run this through our minds like we're watching a movie. Seven fat, happy cows. Whoop, 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 everything's good. All of a sudden, there's seven emaciated, thin cows. Cows, And what, what does it say? Stood by the other cows, 
and ate up the seven attractive plump cows. So what you might be tempted to do is go, and suddenly the cows went, and all the cows disappeared. No, the, these skinny cows slaughtered the fat cows and ate them up. It doesn't say that, but I mean, that's, that would startle me awake. All right, if all of a sudden I'm watching this little dream and now I'm seeing animal carnage, right? I can't watch that on TV. I, I don't know if, you ever, if anyone heard the, uh, uh, there's a movie out called The Beast or Beast. It's with Idris Elba. It's about this killer lion. Well, the movie opens, I start watching and the movie opens and they're hunting this lion. I'm like, nope. I don't, homie, don't do that. I don't watch animals getting slaughtered, you know? You know, so when I'm watching a movie and I see an animal getting slaughtered or something like that, you, this is me. Uh, I have, right now, Gail and Richard, I have my hand in front of my face. So that I only see enough to know when the scene's over, you know? Um, so that would startle me awake. So that I can relate to. Okay. And so he startles awake. And then it just says, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. So, you know, and I can understand that as well. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, let me go back to sleep. That's it. All right. One and done. That's what he thinks. Ain't going to happen. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time in verse 5. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them spread its seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, excuse me, it was a dream. All right, now, um, this definitely would be less offensive to me, because corn, annihilating corn, okay, well, I don't know how bad that would look. You know, there's no blood. But still, you know, it drove home the point, because these are very similar dreams, aren't they? They're literally paralleling each other in both what's happening and in its interpreted meanings. They're identical, all right? So it was enough to startle him awake once again. So he knew at that point something's going on, all right? Verse 8. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for the, all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there were none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. And then here's the chief cupbearer, finally has a, his epiphany. Then the chief cupbearer says to Pharaoh, I'm trying to say it the way he would, like if it was me. Oh, I remember my offenses today. You know, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And he interpreted to us, as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the banker hanged. All right, so verse 14, the Pharaoh now gets Joseph before him, but I'm going to stop there and go back to the dreams. All right, so Pharaoh standing by the Nile River, verse 1. Seven cows come out of the river, verse 2. The cows are attractive and plump, verse 2. The cows feed in the reed grass, verse 2. Everything's happy, plenty of food. Happy cows, all right? Seven other cows come up out of the Nile, verse 3. The cows are ugly and thin, verse 3. These cows stand by the seven plump and attractive cows, verse 3. The thin cows gobble up, eat the fat cows, verse 4. The second dream, there appears seven ears of grain, verse 5. Seven, the seven ears are plump and good, verse 5. They were growing on just one stalk, verse 5. Um, a little different in that they're growing on just one stalk from the cow dream, but still everything's the same. Happy corn, happy cows, happy corn. Everything's plump and juicy. In other words, everything's getting nourished to overabundance. All right. Three sprouted, uh, there spouted seven other ears of grain. And by the way, grain is corn when I looked it up. <clears throat> so it's ears of corn on a stalk. All right. These seven ears were thin and blighted by the east wind. Okay, so they were thin and blighted, meaning they're diseased because they don't have nourishment. All right, they have brown spots. Uh, they're very uh, fibrous. There's no plump 
corn. It's very shrunken, okay? And um, they were blighted by the east wind in verse 6. This is called, there's a name for this. It's called a Sirocco. All right. It's an autumn and spring withering wind that blows into Egypt from the south. It's actually a, a real thing. All right. That when it happens, they get concerned because that means that it's going to dry everything up. It's one of the hallmarks of a coming famine. All right. These thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears in verse seven. So here's the first, in examining these dreams, here's the first two oddities I, I titled it as. The first oddity is that cows don't eat cows. <laughs> they don't eat cows. Cows eat grass. Cows eat hay. Cows don't eat cows. All right? And grain doesn't swallow up grain. All right? So those two things stand out. Pharaoh has two related dreams in one night. Joseph also had two related dreams on separate nights. That's the second point. There's a parallelism going on between Pharaoh and Joseph. All right. In Genesis 37, 5 through 7, Joseph has his first dream. In Genesis 37, verse 9, Joseph has his second dream. They happened in two different nights. Pharaoh's two dreams happened on the same night. That's the only difference. In verse 7, Pharaoh awakens from the second dream. And the statement, and behold, it was a dream. In verse 7 indicates Pharaoh awakening startled as the dream seemed real enough and shocking enough to awaken. In verse 8, these two dreams troubled Pharaoh in a way other dreams never had. They were clearly symbolic dreams and loaded with symbols. Okay? Who else would a Pharaoh consult for interpretations and clarification? All right. So let me see verse 7. Let me just make sure I'm where I am. There we go. Yes. It's actually verse 8. Um, I'm going to put that in there. Oh, I do have it in there. Okay, good. So in verse 8, he calls first his spiritual advisors. All right. These are magicians. All right. And other words you can use for them are magi. Okay, and I'm saying that intentionally because it's going to harken back to the New Testament or harken forward to the New Testament. Second, he summoned any other renowned wise men of Egypt. So he was desperate enough to call uh, a citywide, you know, let's get these guys in. I need to know what these things mean kind of uh, emotion in Pharaoh. All right. So the word magicians in the Hebrew here are, uh, was it magicians? Yes, are, is the word chartom. Car, no, kartom. It's from um, the same word that means a horoscopist as drawing magical lines or circles, a magician. Okay? So... I would say that they're of the same type of occupation as were the wise men, the magi of the Gospels, all right? The thing you have to understand also, since I'm bringing them up, is that the depiction we have, and we have it in all the songs, we have it in all of the, uh, what do they call it, nativity scenes, is how many wise men? There, there's no, it never says there's three wise men. The reason they get three wise men is because there's three gifts presented to Mary and Joseph, or to Jesus, all right? And it could very well be true. It just never says that in the Bible, which is interesting, all right? <clears throat> the main difference is that in Genesis here, there are magicians from Egypt, all right? In the Gospels, they are magicians, magi, from where? From the east. If you went from Israel east, you'd be going away from Egypt. All right? So these guys probably came, the ones in the Gospels, um, from Iran or Iraq. Because that is what is to the, Persia is what's to the east. Okay? All right. And so none of these people who Pharaoh brings to him, magicians or wise men, could help Pharaoh interpreting the dreams, symbolisms, or meetings. 
or meanings. Okay, so in verse 9, the chief cupbearer finally remembers Joseph. And, you know, I wonder if these guys were able to interpret it good enough for Pharaoh if the cupbearer would have suddenly remembered, you know. This could have simply been a man who, who saw opportunity because this failed Pharaoh. He tried to do this. You know, this man, the cupbearer, could have known all along about Joseph, right? But now, with Pharaoh not being able to get this interp the interpretation he is seeking, now the cupbearer is in a really influential position to get favor if he can come through for Pharaoh, right? So I don't know. I don't know if he's truly, I mean, it sounds like he's sincere in his statement because he, he recounts to Pharaoh the whole thing, but he starts it off by saying, now I remember my offenses. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the high road here, and I'm going to say he really did forget and really was feeling kind of bad that he did that to Joseph, all right? All right, so let's see, 10 through 13, Pharaoh sent and called. Okay, so we're still in what we read. The chief cupbearer in 10 to 13 verses explains in detail and accurately to Pharaoh what happened in prison. All right, so I noted that. He didn't uh, fudge over anything. He didn't exaggerate anything. He didn't eliminate anything. He told Pharaoh exactly what happened. All right, um, the dreams and their interpretations, and afterward with his restoration and the chief baker's execution. So he was pretty accurate, you know. So that makes me like the guy instead of saying, ah, oh, he was just a slime bag who didn't want to help Joseph, and now he saw an advantage, so he now he's going to, you know. So I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. All right, so in other words, he tells Pharaoh, this guy Joseph is the real deal. Joseph isn't hanging any banners up in the prison saying miracle crusade. All right? Joseph isn't looking to start a ministry where he's going to profit and, and become famous because God is so using him just so much. I'm, I'm just so chosen and so, oh, I'm elect. You know, it's like that's not with Joseph. That's not Joseph at all. All right. So, I mean, Joseph's just sitting in prison. He, he didn't raise a stink in prison. He didn't, you know, uh, we don't hear about Joseph for two whole years. Okay. So again, remember, these things go beyond mere coincidence. These things go beyond the forgetfulness of man. These things go beyond any schemes or ideas in the mind of man. The reason these things are happening is because it's God's plan for them to happen. This is called providence. God is bringing about these things by his providence, his plan that cannot be thwarted. All he has to do is speak the plan and events happen to make the plan happen. All right? That's what makes him worthy of worship, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, so verse 14. Let me see how far I want to read. Let me just start reading and I'll stop at some point. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Now, I want to stop right there. I want to go over this, this verse. And I want you to catch how things shift because these are the little subtle things you might not even, you'll just glance over because... You're not in study. You know what I mean? When, you, when, you, when you're committing to study, you're, you're going through and you're going, what, are this, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? Oh, look how this shifted. Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. Get Joseph up here. Out, up. Is that what happened? And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Well, he's a prisoner. I mean, whether he grew a beard or just didn't shave for two weeks, you know, there's no real need. You know what I mean? So here's the thing I'm trying to bring out. Pharaoh wasted no time, and that's clear. He immediately sent for Joseph from out of the pit. Do you see it says that? Out of the pit? That's a dungeon. Because other times it's called a house, Right? Sometimes it's, it's kind of 
the way it's portrayed, it's like, it's like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Minimum security prison. And then you get words like this, and all of a sudden it's, it's high security. You know, change, dripping water, dark, cold, dank. So, you know, let's not think that Joseph had it easy. And you're going to see this. Joseph suffered. All right. All right. So he brings him out of the pit. Other words for it are dungeon, hole, and cistern. And into his presence. So understandably, see, this is Joseph. He, it's not like Joseph went, well, you know what, guys? Let's make him wait, you know? It, that's not the flow at all. Joseph is giving Pharaoh respect. He's going, I can't, I am not going to go before Pharaoh with my cl torn clothes and I look like, let me take 10, comb my hair, shave. I want to at least show Pharaoh the respect he deserves as Pharaoh. Okay? That's what's going on here. Joseph prepared visually. He cleaned himself up before entering Pharaoh's presence. He did this out of respect to the office and the person of Pharaoh. So should we give the respect due to others and their office, regardless of their faith or unbelief. Do you see that? Pharaoh's not a born-again believer. That doesn't mean Joseph, you know, being a Hebrew could go, well, well, he's not a person of God. I'll, you know, I'll just go to him in my beard. No. Jesus had the same attitude, didn't he? Right? When he, when he went before kings and things like that, I mean, he didn't disrespect them. Um, when it came time to pay the taxes and, and give their due, he told the apostles to go into the, and I love how he did that. Just, hey, go catch a fish. Inside its mouth is going to be the money we need. You know what I mean? And then he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And, you know, and Romans gives us plenty of scriptures that say that we are to honor our governing authorities because the Lord put them in place. And when that, it says that, it's Romans 13. It became a very popular verse during COVID. All right. Um, when Romans says that, it's not being specific to Christian leadership. It's leaders, period. We had President Obama because President Obama was put there by God. We have Joe Biden because Joe Biden was put there by God. We have we had Donald Trump because Donald Trump was put there by God. All right. So everything we have coming to us, we have coming to us because God deemed fit to say, let it be. All right. Um, good, bad, and ugly, once again. The Geneva Bible translation notes this. The wicked seek the prophets of God in their time of need, while in their prosperity they detest and hate them. All right, now I would apply that more to the cupbearer here than I would to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh didn't even know about Joseph. But when he found out about Joseph, now Joseph, this anonymous prisoner, was important enough to come before Pharaoh. And... Joseph wasn't important enough to the cupbearer until there was a need with Pharaoh. And so, you know, the lost, we can always expect the lost to act in a certain way. You know how that is? Like they're lost. And, and how they treat believers. They, you know, in general, the reaction to your faith will be laughter or scorn. Sometimes hatred. Sometimes persecution. That might be the reaction. But if you have something that will benefit them, then they won't be as concerned about your faith or your witness as long as you can deliver something that's beneficial to them. And that's particularly true of politicians. All right? All right, let's go on. And Pharaoh said to Joseph in verse 15, I have had a dream. And there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, he's going to recount the dreams. Uh, I was standing on the banks of the Nile, seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I have never seen all the land of Egypt. 
And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. And I didn't even note that until just now when I read that. That is the only deviation that Pharaoh makes. It's his own personal observation that the cows and the corn didn't look any better for eating what they did. Okay. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears, withered thin, blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was none who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. All right, and I'm going to start with that verse and then jump back because how does Joseph know that God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do? Now, we know that Joseph is being raised, well, was being raised as a God follower. We know that Joseph has a knowledge of God. We have no record whatsoever other than those two dreams that Joseph had. It's not like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God never visited Joseph. We have no record of that. All right? And yet here, Joseph says God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And he also told Pharaoh earlier there's a favorable outcome. All right? So what can I do? All I can do is speculate. And I would speculate whether it was in visitation while he's in prison whether it was in a felt answer to prayer, um, whether it came by voice or impression, whether it was because Joseph himself had more dreams in prison, Joseph had the gift of interpreting these dreams, and he knew it was a gift given to him by God, and that God was going to use him as a conduit to interpret these dreams, not just for Pharaoh, but for the cupbearer and for the baker before them. All right? So if, if we want to grasp onto something solid to conclude, it's that Joseph is being used by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he knows it. And he's telling Pharaoh this. And Joseph is not owning any of it for himself. He is saying, this is all God. He's not promoting himself. He's not looking to make a ministry for himself. He is staying humble. He wants, what he wants to do is give a testimony of God to this guy. Now, the testimony might have been great for the cupbearer, and it might be good for Pharaoh, but it certainly wasn't good for the baker. But the baker is really inconsequential. The person who's going to get the main impression here and have the most influence on what comes next is Pharaoh. Pharaoh knows about the baker. Pharaoh knows about the cupbearer and their dreams and how the dreams came true, both for the, in the favor of the, in life for the cupbearer and death for the baker. Now Pharaoh's going to see over the course of the next, well, now and for the next seven years, that Joseph was right as well here. That his God, here's the point, his God is real. And when God speaks it, you can bring it to the bank. And it doesn't matter because now they're going to have to go through 14 years, well, seven years before things get rough. And then another seven years of them being able to supply. In other words, the famine ends with favorable outcome before they come out the other end. But throughout that whole time, Pharaoh is seeing that God was right, God was real, and that because of Joseph... Egypt survives. And not just Egypt, all the surrounding nations come to Egypt for relief, including Israel. All right? All right, so let's go. That's, that's the grand overview. So let's dive in. So verses 15 and 16, Pharaoh clearly and concisely lays out the issue and the solution. All right? In 16, Joseph points to God, revealing his simple humble character. Joseph does not use the opportunity to state his case to Pharaoh about how he was wrongfully imprisoned, 
nor does Joseph elevate himself in his ability to interpret dreams. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer, is what he tells him. So he basically just says, I'm testifying of God. All right? His encounter with Pharaoh is instead a witness to God's abilities and to the reality of God. The record of Joseph's character remains constant throughout the entire life, his entire life and his trials. That's important, all right, because Joseph is arguably the number one greatest Christ type in the Old Testament. That would be my uh, opinion, all right? Now, it, doesn't, it, it makes him the greatest as far as how many times we see Christ in Joseph, all right? David is the greatest Christ type of the Old Testament because David is a is the focus of the typology of David David is in Christ the Redeemer Christ the Messiah right so and God calls David a man after my own heart you know he's he's a man that we can look to just like you know I'm preaching in, in uh, Romans on Sundays and I was telling you how up until chapter 4 we were talking about no, in chapter 4, we were talking about Abraham as the example Paul brings us on what it means to be a man of faith or a woman of faith. What does that look like, right? Well, Joseph, it's kind of difficult to do that with Joseph because everything about Joseph's story is this extraordinary life of this guy. Whereas David... His sins are shown to us. His struggles are shown to us. We don't see that with Joseph. So, relatably speaking, David is the greatest type of the Old Testament of Christ. All right, so um, Joseph is humble and innocent. And what I mean is he does not plan mischief, nor does he speak down to anyone intentionally with a desire to offend or hurt. He never does that. Even though in, when he gave his dreams back in, I think, chapter 37 to his brothers, I mean, it's, and, and to his father, the second dream, you're, hey, I had another dream, you're all going to bow down before me. You know, it's like, how can you not interpret that to be Joseph's being condescending to his brothers, and now he's being condescending to his fathers? But you have to understand that's not Joseph's character even though it's taken that way. I have to believe he was being matter-of-fact and not saying these things to his brothers and his fathers to speak down to them at all. Whatever. I'm, the point is I'm, I'm trying to establish a case that his character is not, is not not beyond reproach. Not not above... His character is above reproach is what I'm saying. Because that's the standard used in the New Testament for pastors and leaders. You have to be above reproach. Elders and pastors. And deacons. All right? All right, so 17 through 24, I'm pretty much going to zip right through because it's really just Pharaoh recollecting to uh, Joseph his dreams that we already went over. All right? So he recounts the dreams he had in verses 1 to 7 in verses 17 to 24. Joseph wastes no time, and he immediately interprets these for the man. All right, so he doesn't try to have a conversation. He doesn't say, hey, why don't we sit down on the couch? Let me think about this for a few minutes. You know what, Pharaoh, maybe I better go to God and, you know, spend an hour or two in prayer. He just, he just says, here, the, here it is. You see how easy this is when God gives you the interpretation? You see how easy this is, Pharaoh, when your God is real? Here's the answer, all right? And so verse 25, he gives the interpretation. First, in verse 25, the dreams are identical in meaning. They are two separate dreams delivering one and the same message. Okay? Second point, verse 26, there are seven good cows. And then later on, there's seven good ears of grain and corn. That's seven years of plenty for both dreams. In verse 27, you have seven lean, ugly cows that are seven years of famine. And then later on, you have seven empty ears of grain and corn, grain or corn. Seven years of famine, identical, okay? And then in verse 28, 
It is, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Joseph testifies to Pharaoh, and he says this to him in, in a, a paraphrase. God is speaking to you. The creator of the universe, you unbelieving pagan, has a message for you. He is going to do for you what all your priests and all your magicians and all your wise men could not do for you because they are empty, dead vessels. Now hear from the living God. All right? Not an angel, not a demonic spirit, not his dead grand great great grandfather. Right? Why do I why did I add that there? Well, what's one of the most popular things to do these days? You go to uh, there's a TV show of Teresa Caputo. You have Jonathan Edwards. He's from Long Island as well. Caputo's from Massapequa, because I'm from Long Island. I know these things. Edwards was from Huntington. And Edwards came before Caputo, and their shtick is to speak with the dead. Are they speaking with the dead? No. They're speaking to demons who are playing games. And what's the point of the game? What's the goal of the game? They, they'll comfort their dead loved ones. They'll give them good news. They'll give them warm fuzzies. What they won't give them is Jesus Christ. They'll give them things that will cause them to not put their focus on Jesus Christ. But on the occult. It'll bring warm fuzzies. He doesn't, Satan's not concerned with you feeling warm fuzzies. Satan's not concerned with you feeling love. Satan's concerned with you not feeling Jesus. All right? Not experiencing salvation. Not accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he says to Pharaoh, not so many words, God is speaking to you. God Almighty is blessing Pharaoh with foreknowledge of events very significant to him as leader of Egypt. 29 to 31. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. Just want to highlight that. There we go. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams mean that the thing is fixed by God, and God will bring about bring it about shortly. All right, so I'm going to stop there because now he's going to bring here's what you should do into play. So up to 32. So the next seven years, starting from verse 29. The next seven years will see plentiful annual harvests. It won't see good harvests. It won't see adequate harvests. It will see an abundance, an overabundance of harvest. Okay? Then after that, a severe famine will come, which will consume the entire land. Let me see 29. We're out Egypt. It was seven years. I've gotten land, family consumed the land. Or he's pretty much still speaking about Egypt itself. But the famine does not just, it's not contained to Egypt. It, it's everywhere, okay? It's the Middle East, at least. <clears throat> it will not just bring about a shortage of supply of some foods. I'm thinking about us. You know, COVID ended, and after COVID ended, and even now, I'd say now it's just ending where we had shortages of supplies because the whole supply line got messed up, all right? And uh, certain things became hard to get. Certain things became unavailable where we would go to the store and see uh, six of the same product, different companies. You can only see one or two. Instead of the shelf being full, it's half full, or go to Walmart. I mean, talk about a store going downhill. I, I mean, I remember four years ago, you never saw empty shelves at Walmart. Now, you always see empty shelves at Walmart. All right? Now, it's, the reasons are different, but that's what I'm trying to bring about, is, is that 
there, in, in that seven years of plenty, you will see that happen. And then it's, it's not like it's going to be seven years of plenty, spigot gets shut off, seven years of famine. That's not how it works. You have seven years of plenty. At some point at the end of that seven years, things start getting bad and bad and bad and bad. And you enter the seven years of famine and bad and bad. And at some point, maybe in the first year, they enter full-blown, no food, famine. All right? And it will be very severe, he says in verse 31. And at some point in all of this, the, the meaning gets expanded from land to go past Egypt into all the land. I already said something about that. All right. This is commentary of all our earthly enjoyments. All right. Good things come and good things go. You can enjoy the good things. Just realize all good things come to an end. I've got a beautiful car. Ten years from now. I'll be getting another car, well, however many years. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, you buy a brand new house, and it's, everything's great, and the next thing you know, things start breaking, all right? It's an amazing thing that just the absence of a person living in a house will cause a house to go into decline. The time and earth moves regardless of mankind, all right? Times of great harvest come, and then famines come in life, in things that we have, things that we enjoy. Um, a man who relies on, or a woman, who relies on this life to be their sustaining hope and joy will be sorely disappointed on the day it is all taken away by age, sickness, and finally death. Because up till now, I've been speaking about your car and your house, but what about you? You know, uh... I, if I look at the, the, my life, ages 0 to 12, man, I can't wait till I'm an adult. All right? 12 to 18, I'm going to go to this school, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to have a nice car, and this and that. It's not so much hatred of the parents anymore, but then 20 to 40, or 35, let's say. I'm living the high life. It's getting better and better and better. I always tell people when, when I counsel people who don't have, young people who don't have jobs, I say this, and it's, it's been one of the main things I've observed about life. Whatever it is you do, I don't care if you dig ditches. You be the best ditch digger out there because the day will come will there, when everyone's older and nobody wants to dig ditches. And then there's, or they want $2 million a year to dig a ditch, and you're there for a million digging ditches that are the best ditches in the world. You will rise to the top, and you will become a wealthy man or woman. If you do all things as unto the Lord, you will prosper. But then the funny thing happens. You hit about 45 to 55, and all of a sudden your back starts hurting, you really don't care so much about the seven-bedroom house anymore. All you want is a smaller house with a smaller lawn. Right? And the next thing you know, you're in assisted living. Like I said, in the, in the, I was in the funeral industry for, for about 12 years. We spent our lives all the way in the back of the funeral home at Uncle Willie's funeral. Right? Aunt Bertha's funeral. Next thing you know, it's, you know, they're your great aunt. The next thing you know, it's your aunt, your uncle. Next thing you know, you're moving up. All of a sudden, you've got an assigned seat because it's closer family. Then you're in the front row. Then everyone's there for you because you're all the way in the front in a box. There is not a thing in this world that's important enough for you to feel you have to hold on to it for all of eternity. All that matters in the end is Christ and your eternity. That's all that matters. Okay. At that time of death, all the wealth, plenty, and high estate of the lost will be forgotten by them 
as they stand before the great white throne of judgment and face an eternity of never-ending death. And when I say never-ending death, I don't mean you're dead, you're dead for eternity. You're dead, you're dead for eternity. I don't mean that. Because that's, that's what's called, the biblical term for that would be annihilation. And that's not biblical. All right? Your soul will live forever. You will live forever. Eternal death means that process of grief and mourning and, and, and uh, angst and, well, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's keep it biblical. Of dying is what you will experience forever in ways and depths that you've never imagined as a lost person. All right. There's a reason it's not just called, you'll experience the loss of death for the rest of you. It's called weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a death which never ends for the individual. A death you will live in what the Bible calls torment as exhibited by weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, this is Jesus speaking. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I love how he says there in verse 20 of Matthew 6, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. I mean, what we're going to have, our eternal inheritance, never fades. It never disappears. It's always, it's constant. His promise of that to you is sure. It's yes and amen. Matthew 13, 41 to 43. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace where they do not die. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they do not die. That's why they'll be weeping and gnashing their teeth. It'll be an agony. And if they have a moment to think, it'll be in hatred of God. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And, and I love that line, verse 43 of Matthew 13. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. What does that speak of? What, what is that thing that makes us shine? Well, yes, glory. We will radiate the glory of Almighty God for all of eternity. I mean, the glory of God is so bright that the Bible tells us in Revelation that there's no need for a sun anymore. And when you think about it, you know, we think about, well, you know, Jesus and the Father, they're going to radiate glory so bright. But think about this too. Every saved individual will be radiating that glory. It won't be their glory. It, in other words, it won't be theirs to possess. It's theirs as a gift from the Father. Then it makes a little more sense how there's going to be shining brightness for all of eternity. You okay? Yeah, I lost my thing. Nancy, <laughs> yeah, right? But isn't that the, the glory when, when Adam and Eve fell? That's what they lost. That's what they lost. They lost Absolutely. the glory, and then they realized they were naked because they didn't have that glory yep. covering them anymore. Yep. Yep. You know, things will be restored to how they were in Adam and Eve's time. What, here's what that means, what Nancy just said. That glory, we will have that glory once again. Now, will we need clothes? I mean, I'm, I, who cares? Um, what I don't think will be the same is um, I, I think that I, I still think, you know, we'll have progressed scientifically. That is not lost. It's just glorified. All right? So it's not like we're all going to be walking around, you know, like cavemen wearing skins. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think that, I, I don't know. I, I'm just speculating because who can say? All we can know is what does the Bible tell us? Eye has not seen and ear has not heard of the amazing things God has prepared for those who love him. Whatever. You know? I mean, the Bible says we're given white garments. 
Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. That tells me, because, you know, we know that uh, Jesus says that, you know, the, the righteous will be told to go to the right and the sheep will be told to go to the left. That it will be the angels doing that. They'll be the ones, um, as everybody is brought before the great, great white throne saying, no, 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 you're over there, you're over there, making sure everyone's where they're supposed to be. And then when they are judged, taking those who are judged to eternal hell, the angels will be the ones doing the casting. All right? The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be gnashing of teeth. And then Matthew 25, 46, here's the killer. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal, everlasting life. You see, our souls are eternal. You know, you can make, if you want to be humanistic and take our sense of pity and mercy, you would say, all right, well, I'm glad I'm going to heaven for all of eternity, but why don't we just let them be annihilated? That's the Jehovah Witness view, by the way, that souls are annihilated, all right? That is not the way God is doing things. You know, the standard of everything is that life is eternal. And that there's only, you know, if, if, if the righteous will live for eternity, then the unrighteous too will live for eternity. And that's the way God has ordained things to be. Matthew Henry says this, There is bread which endures to eternal life, which shall not be forgotten, and which it, and which it is worthwhile to labor for. And he gives John 6, 27. Those that make the things of this world their good things will find but little pleasure in remembering that they have received them. And then he gives Luke 16, 25. So in John 6, 27, Jesus says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Which is interesting because that I'm going to use the seal concept a little further down in this chapter. It's interesting. Luke 16, 25, Jesus says, But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. So there's another descriptive word of hell is anguish. <clears throat> okay, verse 32, the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that that thing is fixed by God and God will bring it about sh shortly. So the purpose of God's giving Pharaoh two dreams, which conveyed the same message, was to highlight the fixed nature of what was coming, right? And the seriousness of it, okay? Okay. I'm reminded of Christ in the New Testament once again when he would start off particularly important messages with the words in the King James, verily, verily, I say to you. Or ESV, truly, truly, I say to you. Whenever in the New Testament you read those words, you better be paying attention. It's a double importance statement of Jesus. This is going to come to pass. This is everlasting truth. 25 times in the New Testament, specifically and only in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses that terminology. 25 times only in the Gospel of John. You will not find verily, verily, or truly, truly in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, which surprised me. I was like, wow, that's interesting, you know. Okay, so let's see, 33 to 36. Okay, so that's where we left off. 
So we'll start at 33. <clears throat> now, therefore, so now Joseph, Joseph isn't just interpreting. Joseph is now going to give wisdom, right? It's almost like this guy is the wisdom of Solomon. He's, he just knows exactly what to say. And it comes from God, clearly. And all of this suffering that he has gone through has gotten him to the place where he can accurately and authoritatively speak on behalf of God to the leader of Egypt. All right? Um, I get excited. Because there's so much father and son. We're going to get into it now. It's so cool. Um, now, therefore, let Pharaoh select discerning and wise men and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth, not one-fourth, not one-third, not one-half, one-fifth. How does he know this? I have no idea. One-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. God must have spoken to him, right? Tell Pharaoh one-fifth, not one-third. Not, it's like Monty Python. Three shall be the number of counting, and counting shall be the number three. Um, right. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the, the land may not perish through the famine. All right. So the interpretation over, Joseph now counsels Pharaoh on what he should do to prepare for what is coming. Did Joseph speak this counsel from the mouth of God or from his own counsel? Well, clearly, he was inspired by God. He had to have been. The whole point of this narrative of Joseph is to show God's sovereignty and his providence and how his plans will come to pass and, and how miraculously God preserves the line of Messiah. And we're only at the beginning, really, of this line, starting with Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Right? Right? Four generations. Okay, so God might not have told Joseph how to counsel Pharaoh, but by virtue of his character and virtue as both a man and a man of God, Joseph spoke the wisdom of God to Pharaoh in his counsel to him. All right, so verse 33 tells Pharaoh to select discerning and wise men and set him over the land of Egypt. So who is the most discerning individual Pharaoh had met that day? All right, verse 33. Let me go back. Let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh just had all the discerning and wise men in and they failed. Joseph, without batting an eye, uh, uh, batting his eye, I don't know what, what the term is, batting an eye, just gave him the truth and showed he is the most discerning and wise man in Egypt. All right? <clears throat> Joseph is that man. Verse 34, appoint regional overseers to be in charge of each region's produce. One-fifth of the grains harvested during the seven plentiful years are to be put in long-term storage, and I might add, in each of those regions. Very smart, because it takes the burden off of Egypt itself, the city, to build massive storehouses. They're only responsible for st building storehouses enough to store the grain that's grown around the main city, whatever that city might be, Ramses. Um, I don't know the rest of the names of the cities of the main Egypt. But all of the cities had to build their own. Also makes it easy to redistribute, right? Every, you, know, you don't have to worry about getting these quantities to each region. The food's already there in each region. Really smart stuff. Appoint an overseer over each of them. Because at some point, that overseer is going to be responsible to make sure that the region's populace stays alive. 
All right. And all of this is coming from the mouth of Joseph. All of this is coming from the mouth of God. Verse 35 and 36, these granaries, while located in each region, are not to be under the authority of the local overseers, but under the authority of Pharaoh alone for the release when the times of need come. Let them gather all the foods of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food. You see that? It's not, they're going to be overseers, but they're overseers who are under the authority of Pharaoh. All of these people must look to Pharaoh and his representative if they would live. Sound familiar to anybody? If you as a Christian want to live, you have to look to God who has appointed Jesus as his mouthpiece. Where are you going to look to find the authority of Jesus? Well, it's obvious, Chris. I'm I'm going to the Miracle Crusade because that's where the prophets are. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I don't have to read the Bible. I can get a living word now. That's apostasy, folks. I'm sorry. That's heresy. I'm going to prove it to you tonight in Paul, uh, yeah, Paul's own words. All right? All right. You see that there's typology happening here. We're seeing kingdom principles being told to us through this narrative. And it's not just about Joseph. It's about Pharaoh. It's about these overseers in the land. It's about anybody who will come for food in a time of famine. Who is the bread of life? Right? Joseph is going to be over grain. Jesus literally is the bread of life. And it's spiritual bread. Because your physical existence is not, and this time here on earth is not important when compared to your eternal existence. I have heard it said numerous times by somebody that God is very interested in what you're interested in. God is not very interested in what you're interested in. God wants your interests to be what he's interested in. All right? Now, Surely, if you have interests that do not contradict God, God might flourish you in your interests. But don't think that God's just going to accept everything that you like and enjoy because you said a sinner's prayer. We are definitely called to change. We are definitely called to a confirmation into the image, character, and likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Then you can truly say God is interested in what you're interested in. When your interests line up with his interests. Remember when I preached on love and I preached on phileo? About the measure of phileo is our interests. Tommy and I, to the degree that we have mutual interests, we will be friends. All right? Closer, the more interests we have together, the closer fellowship we have together. Does this make sense to everybody? This is deep stuff. And, um, and it's true. All right, 37 and 38. So Pharaoh, did I read it? No, I didn't. Okay, good. Let me make sure I gave you everything. Yep, I did. Okay. So this proposal, verse 37, pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? What a amazingly profound statement. Because Pharaoh here is acknowledging, A, the God, And B, that Joseph is hearing from this God. Channeling him, you could say. Funneling him. Prophesying through him. Speaking his words, right? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this. Again, see how now that this is not coincidence. Since God has shown you all this. For the second time in two verses, Pharaoh is acknowledging the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. There, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. Message received when Joseph previously said, you know, in verse 34, let Pharaoh proceed. No, that's not it. Let Pharaoh, verse 33, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. 
message sent and Pharaoh message received in verse 39. There is none so discerning and wise as you are. Now verse 40. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. I'm going to stop right there. For the third time, this has happened to Joseph. And the first two times weren't the point. This is the point. This is where it was all leading to. Pharaoh, uh, Joseph was sold into slavery. He was bought by Potiphar. Potiphar said the exact same words to him. I'm putting you over the whole house. Everyone's under your command. The only person you're not going to order around is me. Joseph gets sent to prison falsely for rape or attempted rape. Meets the warden. Works with the warden for a few months. Warden says to him, I am appointing you over all the prison and the prisoners. You shall have authority over everyone except me. And third time's a charm. That's a joke because we don't believe in charms as believers. But he has now arrived at the end game. Pharaoh has appointed him with the same blessing, the same prosperity, the same uh, authority, all because of God. This is all happening because of God. This is God's providence. This is God's sovereignty. This is God's immutability. He doesn't change. God never had to adjust because of the sons of Jacob doing what they did. He never had to adjust for Potiphar. He never had to adjust for Potiphar's wife. He never had to adjust for the warden. He didn't have to adjust for the cupbearer and the butcher or baker, whatever he was. He never had to adjust for any of them. It was all in accordance with God's plan. Every single bit of it led to this moment. Actually, not that moment. The moment's coming when the brothers appear from Canaan starving. All right? That would be the real epitome, the real climax of God's plan. <clears throat> but, you know, I can keep going because is it really? No, because from what's happening here, what we're reading, from that, Egypt and Israel are going to become buds. And Pharaoh's going to invite Egypt, uh, Israel to stay in Egypt. And he likes, he has so much favor because of Joseph. They have so much favor that he gives them prime real estate in a city called Goshen. Then Pharaoh's going to die. And all this time of this Pharaoh's life, animosity's building because Israel's being blessed in this foreign land. More so than so many of the regular people of Egypt. So that when this Pharaoh dies, almost immediately... They get put into slavery. And Goshen turns from prime real estate to the inner city. Like that. Talk about if you own property in Goshen. You were like, no! Right? And I, I'm, you know, I say inner city, and I shouldn't say that because, you know, you, everyone who lives in the inner city has worth and value. And, and really, the inner city doesn't even compare to what slavery is and living in slave camps, all right? So I apologize for that. I shouldn't have said that. So Pharaoh likes what he hears and asks his counselor, does anyone in Egypt, this pagan land, have inside um, of the holy, have inside of them the Holy Spirit of God? No, is the answer to that question, because they're pagans. My belief is that this is a rhetorical question. Pharaoh wasn't asking because he was curious, Pharaoh already had the display of the wise and discerning men of Egypt, and they couldn't discern a dream, all right? So it was a rhetorical question, which he was answering in what he said next. Um, and what he said next was, you're that man, Joseph, okay? All right, so over my house, all right, I already said all that. What did I read through 43? No. Okay, so in verse 41, no, in verse 40, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. 
And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him ride in the second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee! Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. So what's he doing? He's giving Joseph all control, all right? And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Sephanath Paneah, and he gave him in marriage Asnath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. When Joseph was 30 years old, he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Now, we're going to stay late tonight because I want to get through this. This is all prophetical of the coming Christ. This is all typological of the coming Christ and the kingdom of heaven. This is all typological of the citizens of of heaven and their rights and privileges and duties. All right, so let's start. So Pharaoh answers his own question. This is God's plan and providence unfolding in Pharaoh appointing Joseph. Again, in the fullness of time and at the right time, this happened to Joseph. In the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4, At the right time, Romans 5, 6, Jesus came. That's what this is pointing to, okay? We cannot judge our present circumstances as the end. We must be able to, in faith, trust that God is doing something, something which he has not yet reached its fruition. We then must remain in faith towards God during these difficult times, all right? Both patient and long-suffering, enduring what we must until God decrees its end and the blessing. Such is this life for us, which will have its end as a beginning. All right? What's the beginning? Your death. In your death, you will enter the fullness of the inheritance and very truly, you can say it's a new beginning. Now, we've already, we're already children of God. We're already adopted. That's all done. We've already got in heaven a spiritual wallet. And inside that wallet is a license that says, Ken Robinson's uh, Certificate of Citizenship, Kingdom of Heaven. We've got all that. What we don't have is freedom from sickness, death, uh, mental struggle, emotional struggle. Right? What we don't have is the full illumination in our being of who God is, who Christ is, his love for us, his glory in us, glorified bodies. I can go on and on and on, and I probably wouldn't even be touching the surface. All right? So in one way, I can say that our, our beginning has already started because it started the day you were born again. Right, But in another very real way, it doesn't start until the fullness of the inheritance doesn't start until we enter eternity, okay? Or his return first. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of of his glory. Remember, Joseph is a Christ type. Pharaoh here is a type of Father God. Just as Pharaoh appointed Joseph savior of Egypt and the surrounding lamb uh, lands, the father appointed the son for the salvation of the world, the Lamb of God, Messiah. For all who would be saved from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Acts 10, 40 to 42. But God raised Jesus on the third day and made him to appear, 
Not to all the people. Not to all the people. He didn't come to save the world. God so loved the world in the salvation of people from all tongues and tribes being saved. But not every people, every person from all tribes and tongues being saved. So he made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the appoint, the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. He is the one. Buddha is not the one. Krishna is not the one. L. Ron Hubbard is not the one. Confucius is not the one. Allah is not the one. Muhammad is not the one. I can go on and on and on and on. Christ is the only Savior of God. All right? John 6, 27, I read earlier, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. See, Joseph in this narrative is all speaking in terms of food that perishes to illustrate a spiritual truth about the food that never perishes. All right. So the typology points us to Christ being the bread of life, even if it's imperfect, because Joseph is giving out physical food for a physical reason. So it falls short in that way, yet fully uh, illustrates to us the truth of the New Testament, that Jesus is the bread of life. Okay. Hebrews 3, 1 and 2. Let me just do something there. Okay. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Jesus was appointed for his mission. All right. Now, it was God's pleasure to send Jesus, and it was Jesus' joy to be the sacrificial lamb of God. So you can't look at God as a cruel, you know, if you look at a father in human terms, sending his son to die, that's an abusive father. Well, God's not abusive. God had a plan of salvation. The shedding of blood was required. And while there was an appointing and a commissioning and a commanding to go, Jesus joyfully took this commission. And for love, God sent him for this. And for love, Jesus came for this. All right? Um, so who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. You can preach about Moses all you want, but as a Christian, you're preaching better point to Jesus Christ, how Moses is a type of Jesus Christ. It, it, you can't simply end with Moses. You have to end with Jesus. See, and that's shown time and time again throughout the New Testament, whenever it's Jesus or the apostles sharing, um, uh, witnessing, testifying about Jesus using the Old Testament scriptures, they always return to Jesus as Messiah. It's all about Jesus. All right. So Jesus was appointed by the Father and by the Father's sovereign will and decree. All right? God decreed it. God willed it. God is sovereign. So his providence will uh, be accomplished, will work out. All right? Cannot be thwarted. Moses also was appointed by the Father to be the Christ type who would redeem the people from Egypt. Je Joseph is appointed by God to be the Christ type who feeds a people. Right? This is all pointing to Jesus. We are appointed by the Father to be his children, to be elect. We are elected. We are foreordained. We were, uh, let me say this again. We are appointed by the Father to be his children. We were appointed by the Father to be his children. Every person who's out there right now lost, who is saved, will be saved only because before the foundation of the world, God chose them. That's only scripture. That's not me. It's scripture. Will you accept 
Scripture? Or will you add to it? Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him at a later date. Because I wasn't born saved. Michael wasn't born saved. Ethel wasn't born saved. We lived X amount of time as enemies of God, chosen by God. And then one day, that choosing, just like with Joseph, ending up before Pharaoh, we ended up before Christ. Save me. Because God willed it. <laughs> Praise God. All right. That we should be holy and blameless before him. I'll go on. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, I'm going to be very straight with you here. That doesn't bode well for those who are not chosen. Who of you can say that you know the fullness of God's will, intention, and plans? Just because the idea that there might be people who aren't chosen of God is not an appealing thought does not make it wrong or less true. If I'm wrong... In our interpretation of the scriptures, well, praise God. Then everyone can choose, and everyone has the ability to choose, and everyone has a choice. The truth of the matter is, there is truth in that statement, because if it wasn't true to some degree, then the guilty could not be condemned guilty for re uh, rejecting Christ. But there is a truth to election that is true and cannot be altered, just as there is a truth in free will that cannot be altered. And we cannot, any of us in our flawed human understanding, fully say we understand that or can teach it so that it perfectly accommodates one the other. God does. You see, these are the things that makes God, God. If, if, if Rich Hardy could explain it to me, I'd worship, I could worship Rich Hardy. Right? But he's not God. He doesn't know. We don't, none of us know. God is God. Amen. His thoughts are not our thoughts. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, why am I, why am I harping on election, God choosing? Well, because this whole narrative teaches it the doctrine this joseph narrative of what's going on with joseph here teaches the doctrines of election predestination and 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 what's not accommodated free will the cupbearer didn't have free will joseph didn't have free will right he ended up a prisoner um the warden didn't have free will potiphar didn't have free will um Pharaoh didn't have free will. Well, Pharaoh chose, but Pharaoh was being used by God as a type to illustrate the father choosing Jesus. So what we're talking about here is not free will, but God's sovereign election is what we're talking about. Predestination and being foreordained. That is, these are themes of this Joseph narrative. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. That you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. That can only happen if God chooses a person. A person can fake it until they make it in church. If they are not elect of God, they will not bear fruit. True fruit. They may try to bear false fruit. But in the end, that fruit will reveal itself. All right? Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. All right, so it's 736. I still have 
quite a bit to go, so I think I'll stop to end here. Okay. I'm going to pray tonight. Father God, I, I, I want to humbly come before you and thank you, Lord, that um, you have chosen me and that you have used me and are using me to teach these wonderful truths of your new covenant in the Old Testament through Joseph, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us, all of us, Lord, online, on Facebook, on Zoom, here in the church tonight, and all those who will see this on YouTube, Lord, with this knowledge and understanding and ability to see you in Pharaoh, to see your son Jesus in Joseph, and to see us, which I didn't get to tonight, but I'll get to next time, uh, in the people of Egypt who are fed by the bread of life. Lord, um, Jesus truly was your plan from before the foundation of the world. He was the Lamb of God. And truly, Lord, all of your scriptures in the Old Testament point to Jesus. And they all have their meaning in the New Covenant and in Messiah. Lord, may we always seek to find you, Lord Jesus, in the Old Testament. May we, without adding you where you don't belong, of course, um, in accordance with your will, Holy Spirit. Lord, may we glorify you. Lord, we ask, I ask on behalf of everyone here tonight, Lord, that our love for you would be growing because of what we heard this evening, because of what we hear every Wednesday, every Sunday, every Tuesday when, when we pray, Lord God. Lord, Lord, may we, our coming here, our spending time in the Bible, whether it's at home or in church, Lord, may we have in our minds a mission that we are conforming ourselves to your image, Lord God. That we want to and that we will apply what we learn to the conforming of our character to your character, Lord. Not that it's a weight or a burden that should weigh us down and make us feel guilty, Lord, but that as a goal to be attained and something we strive for out of love for you, glorying in you, because we know that we have found our rest in the gospel, Jesus. We know that we have found our rest in you and that you are our Sabbath rest. Lord, we love you and we praise your holy name and we thank you. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thank you all for being here.